Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed the second coffee breakout session. Um, we're on to our, our next session. Uh, we have, this is the second last session of the day, so we're, we're winding to the end of the festival. Uh, very much looking forward to this session uh, titled Two-Eyed Seeing Centennial College A Block Expansion Project. Uh, we're uh, joined here by two architects, uh, so I'm going to briefly introduce them, introduce them both and then I'll hand the stage over. So first, Aladia Smoke is an is Anish Abekwe from Obishi Kokong, Lac Sol First Nation, with family roots in Alderville First Nation, Winnipeg, and Toronto. She has worked in architecture since 2002, founded Smoke Architecture as principal in as principal architect in 2014. She teaches as a master lecturer at Laurentian's McEwen, McEwen School of Architecture and serves as a founding member of the RAIC's Indigenous Task Force. Cohen is a partner at Dialogue and brings an impressive wealth of knowledge in large complex institutional projects. Cohen's background in both interior design and architecture allows her to deliver a holistic approach through a dual discipline perspective. Her national and international award-winning work is characterized by exceptional quality of light, careful material choices, use of color, and a selection of furnishings that harmoniously elevate the overall spatial experience of every building. I very much look forward to learning more about this in, in, inspirational project on Centennial's campus. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Ani, bonjour. Keshi Kapawik and Dijnakas. So my name is Lady Smoke. Um, my Anishinaabe name means she's uh, quick, uh, which can mean I understand things fast or I move quickly. <laughs> so that's good on uh, uh, late on an afternoon such as this. Um, so I'm joining you today from Odom Territory. I happen to be in Arizona supporting my sister right now. And um, yeah, really pleased to be here with Cohen. I'll pass it over to you, Cohen. Awesome. Thanks, Aladia. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for attending this great session. Aladia and I are really delighted to present the Centennial A Block expansion project to all of you today. We recognize the theme for this year's festival was uh, is based on resilience and sustainability. And we're really looking forward to showcasing this project through a slightly different lens, a unique one of social and equitable sustainable design and illustrating how the project was formed and has evolved over the last two years. So for those not familiar with the project, the building is located on Centennial College's Progress Campus in Scarborough, Ontario. The building will be a new landmark uh, project for the college and will enrich the campus entrance, promote the future of education in a diverse and inclusive environment that embodies the college's deep commitment to truth and reconciliation. And the building may also become the first net zero carbon mass timber lead gold higher education facility in Canada once it's complete in 2023. So forming the gateway to the building, the A block expansion connects directly to the existing A block building and it completes the truncated corner of the site, forming a gateway to the campus. We tried to design a prominent animated and dynamic facade but also acts as a tool, a tool for storytelling and speaks to the college's aspirations through the building envelope articulation and design that Aladia will speak to in greater detail shortly. One of the guiding, sorry Aladia, one of the guiding principles that Aladia will speak to in greater detail was seamlessly integrating Indigenous principles in the early formation of the site and building. The building was very conscious of the cardinal directions, which directly informed the location and prominence of the east entrance to the building on the ground level. And we also opened the building to the north direction for the main student circulation space that connects all students, faculty and staff to the heart of the building, which is where we place the Indigenous Commons and the adjacent outdoor courtyard teaching space. You'll hear in greater detail shortly about the Indigenous arts and crafts, animal skins and shingling of traditional had in the Shone Lung houses that all informed the building envelope that wraps the building mass and administration floors at the upper levels. 
And accessibility was another guiding principle for the project. In designing the building and shaping the interior program elements for the project, accessibility and universal design were strongly formed the overall planning and building in connecting users to the circulation within the existing A block building. But our engagement of also the college's various stakeholders also allowed us to introduce critical program spaces that support meaningful access and use by the college that we'll speak to in more detail later on. And sustainability was one of the guiding principles for the project and for the building as a zero carbon sustainable approach, reducing the operational carbon through effective building envelope design, by uh, using PV panels that turn sunlight into electricity, but we're also locking in the carbon through the use of the mass timber wood structure. We've also extended the sustainability approach to the site ecosystem, as well through the introduction of indigenous local plantings that are suited for this location along Highland Creek. And it also embraces the indigenous approach to living in harmony with nature. And with that, I'll pass it to Lady. Thanks, Colin. Uh, part of uh, our uh, approach to innovation in this project uh, had to do with um, uh, changing, uh, maybe not only uh, raising the goalpost for the performance of the building from a technical uh, standpoint in, uh, you know, some pretty ambitious um, sustainability targets, but also reflecting that in a poeticism of expression, wherein we were um, being uh, quite overt with the narratives that were uh, uh, talking about the interconnectedness of all life. So uh, the building had a series of Indigenous narratives that we'll talk a little bit more about today. Um, the overall story of the, of, of, the, of the building was one of growing from a place of, sun, of the sunrise, the eastern main entry, uh, which was a place of seed, uh, going through a period of growth, which was represented by that rising um, uh, main circulation space in the building, arriving at a place of culmination uh, with a series of uh, public uh, student-centered amenity spaces, uh, including the Indigenous Commons, which we'll talk about, and then uh, finally place, finding a place of balance. And you can see the building gestures um, softly at the corner. Uh, that's um, a subtle gesture towards Highland Creek, which uh, the campus sort of turned its back on and we try to remember it in a variety of ways in this building. So ultimately, we honor those cardinal directions, we honor the interconnection of life and the importance of views and connecting to life systems that surround us. We also uh, harken back to some of the pre-contact architectural typologies from this region, including uh, such precedents as the Wigwam, in the roundhouse, which are both timber frame structures. They're not timber, but actually uh, small scale, quickly renewable uh, bent wood structures. Um, now our contemporary way of handling these quickly renewable uh, smaller uh, wood elements is to laminate them together into heavy timber. So that's uh, part of the inspiration of the facade was how um, the skin of a wigwam or a teepee can be uh, sort of lifted up or augmented or changed to uh, you know, create a sense of connection to the outside world. We were very cognizant of the of Centennial College's good work on um, introducing an Indigenous strategic framework. Uh, the college was uh, really forward thinking in this in that this is a uh, space intended for mainstream student body. Uh, it wasn't Indigenous specific. However, they were very passionate about about uh, building the entire design on Indigenous principles, which is a really novel approach and not one we've seen in a post secondary environment. So we're so excited by this, even more so in that they gave us this book of poetry and they said, this building must manifest this book of poetry. And we were so inspired by that. It's like not a thing we've um, been able to do since school. So the whole design team really got on board with this. Um, the client actually sent us this book of poetry during the proposal phase as we were in design. And so that's what guided our thinking. Uh, so one of the, the key uh, elements of this design was this um, presence on the main pedestrian and vehicular route uh, guiding um, people arriving at the campus. And uh, the way that we handled this topography, which was fairly significant, there was a big rise on land, was that we mirrored that on the inside of the building. 
So we have this almost mirroring effect on the inside informal gathering spaces that reflect directly and connect directly to indigenous plantings uh, adjacent to that main corridor on the outside of the building. As you come to that place of finding balance, the building reaches back down to earth using these seven columns that I'll talk about a little bit later, representing that cyclical relationship between life systems. We also used um, a facade inspiration that we thought would appeal to a wide variety of people. It was very critical to us that we weren't expressing in the facade elements that uh, only applied to a certain group of people. So um, what we did was we used the inspiration of the natural world, things like the scales of, uh, of, of a snake or the, the skin of a fish. And we use that as an inspiration for this uh, small scale cladding device that Dialogue worked to establish, uh, you know, took a while to, to hit upon exactly the right patterning. Uh, at the main entrance, we set the stage with a uh, teaching that came from historical uh, agreements that were commemorated and kept alive in the term in by these living documents called wampum. So wampum are um, were. Uh, have been used uh, since uh, times immemorial to uh, commemorate agreements between nations. And so there are several really critical wampum that, ret that are retained and held primarily by Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, and one of the ones that we wanted to honor, uh, these are two that we thought were really important. And one was the covenant chain representing the sincerity of a heart-to-heart -heart agreement and the dish with one spoon um, where we uh, agree to share territory, keep it clean, take no more than what we need and leave some for others so the dish is always full. That represents our commitment to a sustainable treatment of territory. So at this east entrance, which again is in the direction of sunrise, uh, so significant in that way, we uh, instituted along the stair treads, right as you align up to enter the building, you can see the dish with one spoon pattern on, on the stair treads as you enter the building. Then at that place of uh, re re regaining balance, we have these seven uh, columns that uh, connect the building back down to uh, Shkagamakwe or, or Mother Earth. And those seven columns depend upon um, a, a, a naturalized stone formation. So the stone formation was inspired by shield rock or basalt, basalt columns that are sort of natural to, um, to Ontario. So this is columnar basalt formations in Lake Superior. Uh, these uh, basalt have uh, a sort of a connection with the element of fire because they're uh, caused by volcanic action and other cultures unrelated to North America even recognize these as has, having some significance as well. Uh, on that uh, basalt formation, we sort of saw that as almost the beadwork um, that would be reminiscent of the original wampum agreements. So we chose the friendship belt or that covenant chain of those two figures holding hands to represent the fact that we're entering a time of clear and honest communication with a reciprocal relationship between uh, newcomers and indigenous nations that, um, that opens a path of peace. So uh, this, this has a directional orientation. As we go on our journey, that connection, that heart-to-heart -heart connection is not always obvious immediately. We have, it's something that we have to find. We find it on a journey as we come together. So um, uh, the point at which you see that heart-to-heart -heart connection is in alignment with a summer uh, solstice sunset. So when you align yourself with uh, the same direction that the sun would be uh, in uh, on summer solstice as it sets, you start to see this heart-to-heart -heart connection. Uh, the columns that grow out of that original agreement to share territory um, uh, are represented here, um, the seven uh, sacred teachings. Uh, and it's seven sacred teachings that we inherit from our ancestors. So they're called the grand parent teachings. So uh, what we learned, and it was really amazing during this project um, from uh, Joseph McQuabby, who's since passed on, was that there are also, there are seven Mishonas teachings, which are more famous, and then there's the seven Milkmas or grandmother teachings that are equally as important. 
Kent. So outward facing relationships are guided by the wisdom of the grandfather teachings, the Nishama's teachings, whereas the inward facing teachings, how we treat ourselves and our own sense of integrity uh, internally, those are represented by the grandmother or the no no Kumis teachings. And each one of these teachings is associated with an animal who represents those teachings best. So um, inward uh, facing columns are printed with the footprints of those no uh, animal teachers. And outward facing uh, face of the columns are printed with the footprints showing us the way to the Mishama's teachings. Uh, this is a view as we come around to a uh, summer solstice sunset, uh, that heart-to-heart -heart connection starts to reveal itself and finally we come to a place in our journey where we actually relate to each other. Uh, so this is the hope for our ongoing building relationships <laughs> that eventually we will come to a place of connection with uh, earth, we will come to a place of connection between each other built on this sense of integrity, both in our external and our internal relationships. Uh, that space, that main corridor space, is inspired by the teachings of the Medeogen. So the Medeogen is a teaching lodge used in Medei, um, uh, Medei knowledge sharing. And this, um, this is a, a bentwood framework that really just serves as a platform. Oftentimes when I've been in a lodge such as this, listening to an elder share knowledge, that elder is pointing to things outside of the lodge as illustrating uh, those teachings that are being shared from our ancestors. Um, so this bentwood framework is really an ephemeral platform from which to share metaphorical knowledge inherited from our ancestors. And we've created a space where that kind of knowledge sharing can occur. Um, we've uh, lo located informal places for students to gather and learn from each other, both on the inside and the outside of the building. Uh, sort of hearkening back to the lessons of that Medewagen, where you use the outside world to inspire um, teachings and ways of being that, that relate human life to other than human life. I'll pass this over to Cohen. Thanks, Lydia. So the view that you have in front of you showcases the culmination or the top of Wisdom Hall, as Lydia described, which is what you can see in the background is food services, which I'll speak to shortly, but also the glazing um, just above this open uh, collaboration area for students is a glazing that overlooks an administration level of above. We recognized an opportunity to be able to showcase and Eladia and uh, Larissa from Smoke Architecture really brought in a, um, a connection to the building's place. Uh, as you spoke, Eladia, to Highland Creek and its location the introduction of a graphic film that I'm hoping you can speak to in the next slide can showcase the opportunity for that within the space as well. Yeah, so that, um, that connection to Highland Creek was somewhat forgotten by the campus. Most of the campus buildings face away from Highland Creek and there actually isn't very successful pedestrian access to the creek area. However, as Anishinaabek uh, peoples uh, will tell you, uh, waterways were really our highways and uh, that element of water is so critical. It represents life. Water is life is a phrase that you'll hear often uh, speaking with Anishinaabe peoples. So um, what we thought is we should really honor the history of the campus being close to that creek. So you'll see outlined in gray the creek meander adjacent to the Progress Avenue campus. We took that meander and we, um, this is uh, how we um, represented it on uh, that glass film um, so that people would know what we were doing in this next slide where we show it uh, as a, a ceiling baffle treatment above uh, this cafe. And I'll let um, Cohen talk to you a little bit more about the importance of this cafe to the whole uh, facility. So as we mentioned, there's a lot of seamless connection to the Indigenous design principles that permeated into every facet of the building. You can see from the visualization of this food service area um, located on level three of the building. We were fortunate to work with the college. This was actually originally um, going to be an entirely shelf space area for a third party vendor to take over. 
And we approached the college um, about the opportunity to design it with them holistically uh, using the principles that a lady and I have been speaking to from the beginning. And they agreed. Uh, so we were fortunate to, to really um, hone in and, you know, continue the design language from a materiality um, and a formation perspective into this space. Uh, to inform the cafe. What's also unique about it is that the college is actually really looking forward to uh, showcasing Indigenous culinary arts and food within the cafe. So again, students and visitors will have the opportunity to eat um, food that connects them to, um, you know, the, the heart of this building as well and, and to the people that formed uh, a big part of the, of the design. The name of the cafe, which we also affectionately named, uh, is a ode to the Longhouse Medewigan that uh, Eladia spoke of in terms of um, that inspired the formation of Wisdom Hall as well. On the next slide, you'll see that the cafe also provided a unique opportunity to allow for light to penetrate through the frosted glass um, into that overlooks the Indigenous commons below that you'll uh, hear about shortly. Again, from an accessibility perspective, every space included, including the cafe, supports meaningful access for staff and students from both the public and the staff side of the servery and all the way into the back of house kitchen space. Every um, corner and facet of the design was considered. And then the intricate design continues um, into the uh, formation of the student corridor, which uh, Eladia will speak to in greater detail regarding the articulated baffle design. You know, I love, love even the millwork here sort of reflects that facade detail that was worked out so carefully. Um, yeah. Sort of like, uh, I don't know, we have layers of uh, la layers of experience here. <laughs> this is like a really exactly. intimate. <laughs> and then exactly. the other one was more of a particular experience. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so this is the main corridor leading to that cafe. Uh, this is uh, the upper area looking over the main sort of informal student gathering all the way up those stairs that you saw before. Um, what was important here is that meander of Highland Creek is still represented here in the ceiling baffles and our approach here was that the elements of water and the elements of fire are both fairly important in our thinking. Um, so this represented that element of water or creation since we all come from water. Uh, because it represents creation, we thought uh, it would be wonderful to decorate these baffles with representations of both the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee creation stories. Uh, Anishinaabe go clockwise in ceremony. So going from east to west, we have on the vertical face of those baffles, the Anishinaabe creation story. Uh, Haudenosaunee actually go the opposite direction, which when I learned that, I thought it was crazy, but I was really surprised, <laughs> but they do. In ceremony, they go counterclockwise. So in the direction from west to east, on the other side of these vertical baffles, we have the Haudenosaunee creation story represented. This is a view of uh, how those baffles uh, represent the creek bed meander of Highland Creek adjacent to the campus. So you can see this on all levels uh, where the main corridor is, is, uh, is overarched by these uh, these acoustic treatments. Uh, this brings us to the place of the Indigenous Commons. So the Indigenous Commons uh, is a space uh, that's inspired by the teachings of uh, the Anishinaabe Roundhouse. So uh, uh, one word for that is the Nami Itawigamig. So that's the place where we come to dance together. Um, so that roundhouse uh, is meant to have a drum right in the center there. Uh, this space, of course, will be a multi-purpose space. It can be used for events, for ceremony, for uh, gatherings, for programming, for um, anything that uh, the uh, Centennial College can think of. Um, so the uh, the form of the of the room, you can see it, it was also inspired by that sort of gentle curve of the wigwam or those bent wood structures that we talked about earlier. Uh, the, the, the room represents the interconnectedness of all things in that the four columns that frame the space uh, represent gateways to the four cardinal directions and all of those teachings that are associated with those directions. There's also honoring uh, the direction of up or sky, uh, where all life sort of comes from. Uh, 
um, the, the connection between sky and earth is what, um, you know, generates all of life. So that connection to sky is really important. The direction of down, uh, you know, is a connection with our mother, Shigamakwe, who, you know, supports all life and continues to give birth constantly to new life and new diversity. The direction of center is hearts, is, is representing our heart. Um, and that's why that's where the drum goes, because when one hears the rhythm of the drum, we realign with the rhythms of all life. We sit in a circle in the space because the circle represents equity, that everybody who sits in that circle has an equal contribution to make and an equal responsibility to make that, that, that contribution. So there's um, multiple teachings embedded in the space and we thought it was really important to bring those through in the architectural expression. I'll pass it over to Cohen to talk about this. So from the Indigenous Commons, we now showcase another area of the building. Uh, the expansion that you've heard about today is actually a new building that connects to an existing A Block building. And part of our work um, as architects and designers was to renovate a small portion of that existing A Block that included student touchdown areas for classrooms and a shelf space from an oddly shaped space that was left over. But we quickly saw an opportunity to expand on the inclusive and diverse needs for the student body and for the project. And we went to the college once again with the uh, notion of introducing a multi-faith room in lieu of leaving an empty room for storage. The college immediately agreed and we were able to design a space that support wellness, prayer and respite for students and staff. The ablution spaces also off of this area it includes our two uh, accessible spaces. We have also included for shoe, coats, and furniture storage, and essentially created a, an extension of a quiet and flexible space for, for its users. Part of the discussion um, that both Aladia and I had during our stakeholder meetings and user group discussions was also about how to bring more of that inclusive design to the project. And a big part um, outside of just the multi-faith room was the introduction of all gender washrooms throughout the facility. It was a really important notion in terms of the college moving into a new direction to allow for a spectrum of user needs, but also tied in beautifully with the indigenous principles of two-spirit persons that also would benefit from not having to necessarily have identification of both male and female uh, binary uh, genders. So we really had an opportunity to really shape the program of the building beside um, the, the original kind of uh, formation of of uh, the building owner requirements. And then the multi-faith again um, is an interior space that um, unfortunately doesn't have a direct connection to the outdoors, but we were able to introduce clear story glazing, um, which allows for daylight to penetrate through. And on the next slide, you'll see the introduction of a green wall that we were also able to introduce within the space to again, connect to biophilia and the connection to nature, which um, again, every element of the building, as Aledia mentioned, has this layered effect of connecting through various scales and mediums to important uh, guiding principles of the design. Uh, close by, but not immediately adjacent, is this interior courtyard. Now, this was, uh, you know, uh, a request of the client group. They're very serious about having it, and um, as designers, we were excited to use the space. Um, right at that uh, circular entrance that you see, that's the Indigenous Commons we looked at before. Uh, just to the left and off screen, there's a viewing garden that's um, connecting a direct umbilical connection to Shkagamakwe that's view, uh, visible from all levels, even the basement, so that everyone, no matter where you are in the building, can orient themselves to this direct physical connection to Earth. Um, this interior courtyard has been designed as an outdoor classroom where uh, students can come and gather in a circle or use it as an informal gathering space, as you see here. Um, and uh, we, we noticed something as we started designing the space that there was a predictable, uh, very strong shadow line that uh, falls in this space and of course due to the movement of the sun it falls in a different space de depending on the time of year so we thought what a wonderful chance to honor uh, grandmother moon so uh, we have the 13 um, uh, ribs inside of the main indigenous commons representing the 13 
full moons of a year. And we honor it once again here in this interior courtyard with this created pattern uh, that marks out the, 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 where the, that shadow line falls at noon on every full moon throughout the year. So the full moons that fall in this courtyard, we have them marked and they are actually corresponding to the Anishinaabemowin word for the, uh, for the moon. That Anishinaabemowin uh, word actually uh, conveys the, the activities that we do out on the land during that time of the year. So this is another way that we connect to a knowledge of how our life is connected with uh, those systems of life that surround and support us. Uh, one other gesture that we made in this interior courtyard was this landscape element of a terrace sitting area. So when we looked at these terraces, we thought of the four, uh, the teachings that we'd heard before of the four levels of existence, which um, in Anishinaabemowin in thought is a way of categorizing uh, the life that surrounds us. So first, on the first level is um, that uh, sort of underwater, under soil creatures, all of those things that live below the surface. Uh, on the next level is all of those of us that go walking on the ground. Uh, the next level is those of us who live in the air. Uh, so the, all the air creatures, the winds and the clouds. And then finally, the celestial realm. So all of those things, all of those beings that exist outside of our, of our planet. So we honor them here using the original Anishinaabemowin words for each of them. So you can see all the things that go on the ground, the things that go in the air, and the celestial beings. And right on the main level, uh, right, right against the ground, is all of those under, under soil and underwater creatures represented in uh, the original Anishinaabemowin. Uh, so we've shared with you a few of the narratives that we've embedded in this space and it was really thanks to the passion and excitement of our clients, the passion and excitement that we shared with dialogue and the fact that we could all collaborate so effectively with our expert um, other professionals like landscape architects, Vertex and, uh, and the amazing engineering crew to make all of this happen. So. As we, as we think about the next steps for architecture and how we can shift the, prof the profession, how we do buildings into a realm where we're actually giving back to the environments that surround us as opposed to foisting our problems off on, <laughs> on all of those life systems that are trying so hard uh, to support us. As we shift our perspective, I hope that this uh, sort of gives some hints as to how architecture can poetically express those values um, that will bring us to take those proper steps to come back together as uh, different peoples, different cultures, uh, human and other, hu other than human life, and that we have to understand uh, that we all have a role to play as individuals, as nations, as countries, continents, the world. We are all part of that next step. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll take questions. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Uh, lots of questions streaming in, so we'll start to grab a few of them. Um, the first question here, how do students, staff, and visitors learn of the stories that were read behind, through, and into the building? Yeah, that's, that's definitely a conversation that we had with uh, the Indigenous Working Group led by Sean Kinsella and um, uh, Shannon uh, Winterstein, along with our amazing clients, uh, Centennial College. <laughs> so they were, you know, being an educational facility, uh, they really thought about how best to tell these stories. So part of the narratives uh, hint at a uh, larger um, wealth of information. For example, uh, the Anishinaabemowin words on the terraced um, gathering space in the courtyard. Um, now, uh, speaking with Sean, he said part of that onus lies on on people entering the space to do their own research and find out and ask questions. But of course, part of the onus will be on uh, the future inhabitants, those educators who are using space to continue telling those stories. 
Um, what I have found is with uh, Anishinaabe uh, peoples um, and, uh, and actually a few other indigenous groups that I've spoken with, the really important things are shared verbally. So we didn't want to put a whole bunch of uh, you know, informational and interpretive plaques around the building. But um, Sean envisions uh, a process whereby his, in his director, or in his position as director of the Eighth Fire, <laughs> which is the best title I've ever heard for anybody, uh, they'll be able to <laughs> go on, on, yeah, the best one ever. Um, <laughs> they'll be able to continue telling those stories as part of an interpretive undertaking. Uh, that enters into the curricula and the programming delivered by Centennial College. One thing, Aladia, that you didn't mention that I think is important in your involvement and with the college is also the integration of artwork throughout the building. And I think that's an important element in that the building is still going to continue to evolve after Aladia and my involvement uh, from a design perspective. It's going to continue telling stories um, in different um, elements of the building that are integrated to be able to share through story uh, and through a narrative of hopefully both the faculty and staff to students and visitors. So I think there's a real element that it'll continue to evolve as well, which I think is really quite beautiful. Yeah, that's great. That all makes a lot of sense. Um, the next question, I think this is a, a good thought. Um, you mentioned working with the client around their Indigenous strategic framework. What did that look like from a design perspective and who collaborated uh, with you on this approach? So the Indigenous Strategic Framework was something that the uh, that Centennial College um, created uh, in collaboration between their, uh, their own uh, Indigenous staff and faculty uh, and with uh, the input from um, an external uh, uh, Aboriginal Education Council, they call it the AEC. So we had multiple meetings uh, with uh, the Indigenous Working Group. I think we counted about a dozen with their group and then we had uh, approximately I believe three or four with the Aboriginal Education Council to sort of validate our direction. Now the procurement process was a little bit challenging because uh, they gave us a pretty good wealth of information in the form of the Book of Poetry by Stacey Laforme and their Indigenous Strategic Framework, which was really well thought out. They also employed two-row architects with Brian Porter and Matthew Hickey to inform their owner's statement of requirements, which was really great because, uh, because we had Indigenous people on the client side representing uh, their ability to, um, uh, to I guess, um, uh, verify that the design was uh, proceeding in accordance with the owner's statement of requirements. And we had Smoke Architecture together with Dialogue and the Ellis Dawn team uh, to, to make those uh, you know, directives a reality. We had a great synergy there um, because the, the, the college had really done their work um, prior to procuring their architects. Uh, the only hiccup was that we weren't allowed to speak to anyone during the design. The procurement process had it that we had to make the design um and uh design the whole thing uh and then win the project <laughs> to be able to talk to the people we were designing for which is completely the opposite of how we normally do it it was really anxiety inducing and very strange um but thankfully uh we've been taught sufficiently both dialogue and myself so well by our previous clients that we were able to bring forward some really strong narratives that seems to ring uh, true with the client group once we finally managed to speak with them. And then, of course, after we spoke with them, some quite a few things got completely redesigned. For instance, the Indigenous Suite, we put a placeholder design. We knew it was going to change, and it did. It completely changed once we started to talk to the user group. So that's sort of how that panned out. And I think it's really to Centennial College's credit uh, that they brought on an Indigenous uh, architect uh, during their process of establishing the statement of requirements. That was so, so smart. Yeah, that's great. I think sometimes we don't talk enough about procurement model and how that enables or makes certain design objectives challenging. But so that's interesting to hear a little bit about that. Um, a question about accessibility, and uh, I, I agree, it looks like a, a lot of attention has been paid to uh, accessibility uh, as this design has evolved. Um, so question around maybe some of the biggest challenges from an accessibility perspective, and then if there are any 
uh, big aha moments that you could share uh, that you intend to take forward into other designs? So I think Aladia spoke about it to start when she spoke of the siting in terms of that east entrance and the sloping of the land in terms of the site. So our challenge was that we have an entry on the uh, ground floor on the east. Our main entrance uh, comes in on the second and we knew that the student highway, which is the main circulation path that connects a multitude of various buildings on the Centennial campus exist on level two. And so our biggest challenge was how to create an equitable, uh, equitable experience for students as they're working their way through the various floors of both the academic and administration levels. Um, and specifically how to create a, um, an experience again uh, that allows students to connect through a tiered with the tiered wisdom hall, which is our design for that north facade that um continues to climb up the building so what we've introduced are these terraces on each of the floors that allows for gatherings so as you saw by wisdom hall we have these stairs that allow for students to sit and interact uh, and actually um, make their way up the building but at each floor that's accessible through an elevator and through a very intuitive uh you know, wayfinding strategy of the building students and, and faculty can make their way to these terraces that also have the same type of collaboration opportunities as other spaces in the building. I think from another accessibility perspective, as I mentioned, is the introduction of all gender washrooms. Uh, we also have universal washrooms located throughout, um, as well as lactation rooms strategically located in the building for mothering. Um, so we, we really looked at the building through as many lenses as we could when we dove into making it a meaningful experience for its users yeah that's fantastic thanks for thanks for sharing all of that and for the the entirety of the presentation it was really good to see a wonderful project so congratulations thanks, Mike. Uh, 